Good morning to everyone that's here. I have the ultimate honor today to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Peter Singer. Dr. Peter Singer has been called the world's most influential living philosopher. While a large part of this description is because of his work on the ethical aspects of how we treat animals and the influence that his writing has had on the development of effective altruism. On a personal note, I can say that his seminal work, Animal Liber Liberation, was my first introduction to, and it set the moral guideposts for me on animal rights and effective altruism. His book, The Ethics of What We Eat, examines the moral need to look at our food choices and how those choices have an impact on all living things. His books, The Life You Can Save, and more recently, The Most Good You Can Do, are modern day roadmaps on how philanthropy can do the greatest good for the most vulnerable. Dr. Singer is a professor of bioethics with a background in philosophy. In 2021, he was awarded the Bed Bruin Prize for Philosophy and Culture. Dr. Singer will speak on speciesism and equal consideration of interests and on the problem of intensive farming that inflicts miserable lives and suffering on the largest number of animals. I ask the audience to take this chance to type any questions that you might have for Dr. Singer in the chat box that you see on the screen. Welcome, Dr. Singer, and over to you. Thank you very much. Supporters, um, I'm truly honored to be a keynote speaker to open this important uh, conference in India. Um, and so I, th I thank you for that. Um, it's more than 50 years now since I first became aware of the issue of the treatment of animals as a serious ethical issue. Uh, I must admit that growing up in Australia, um, I didn't really think about this in the 1960s, for example. It, it really wasn't an issue on my radar. I was concerned about many other issues like uh, the war in Vietnam, which I opposed, uh, equality for humans. But like many other people, I thought that issues about animals uh, really only for animal lovers. And I never considered myself an animal lover in that sense. Um, I wasn't the kind of person who wanted to have uh, a lot of dogs and cats living with me or anything of that sort. But my eyes were opened by a chance meeting with a Canadian a graduate student at Oxford. I was myself a graduate student at Oxford then in 1970, um, who told me that uh, many animals were being brought indoors uh, and did not have the good lives that I imagined they did in the fields. And uh, this led me to think about the ethics of how we treat animals. Uh, I was studying ethics and, and philosophy at Oxford, but uh, as I say, I'd never really thought about this as an important issue. But when I did, I started looking at what philosophers of the past had said about this. It seemed to me that very often they were really using bad arguments, even though they were good philosophers, they were using bad arguments to justify uh, use of animals and the fact that we exploit animals. They were all meat eaters, of course. Um, and so they thought that this was something that you had to justify and they had to explain it. What I eventually came to see is that this is a, a pattern that we sh are familiar with from uh, the way in which dominant groups of humans have treated disadvantaged humans. So most, the most blatant example, of course, is the enslavement by uh, Europeans of people of African descent um, and the capture of people from Africa and shipping, shipment to uh, the Amer American colonies as they then were at first and uh, the West Indies to use them merely as, as tools. Now, we of course all condemn this, but um, I think while we have at least uh, officially and in our rhetoric accepted the equality of humans, uh, we have not considered properly the status of non-human animals. So um, I came across a, a, around this time when I was starting to think about this, I came across a little leaflet written by uh, somebody called Richard Ryder, who was also living in Oxford, a, a clinical psychologist. Um, and it had a picture of a chimpanzee, very sad looking chimpanzee, uh, who had been infected with syphilis in order to uh, supposedly try to find 
a treatment for syphilis for humans. And the word across the top of this pamphlet was speciesism. And um, when I read that, I thought, yes, this is really what I've been thinking, that the way we treat animals today is analogous with the way in which uh, European slave traders and slave owners treated Africans and the way in which other racists in other uh, ways have treated people not of their race. I'm speaking to you from Australia now, and we have a shameful history of the colonization of Australia and the treatment of indigenous Australians here too. So while we have risen, you know, to, to some extent anyway, uh, above that and tried to move away from it, the exploitation of animals still goes on. And it is wrong as a basic issue of, of uh, morality, of ethics, of justice, if you like. Uh, it's not only for animal lovers. Of course, people who care about animals have often been the pioneers in calling for better treatment of animals. But it's really something for everyone who cares about uh, justice or the prevention and reduction of suffering to be concerned about the treatment of animals. Because uh, we do not regard the suffering of animals as counting equally with the suffering of humans. And that, I believe, is the essential problem. That, uh, of course, I, I'm not saying that animals and humans are the same in every respect. Uh, obviously, you're all attending a conference at which you're listening to other speakers and you're thinking about ideas. Uh, no non-human animals uh, are really able to take account of these abstract ideas or use the kind of language that I'm using now. But um, they are capable of suffering. Um, and so I think that is the basis on which we must say pain is pain and pain should count equally, irrespective of the species of the being who is in pain. Just as it would be quite wrong to say, well, that person is not a member of my race, so I will give less weight to their suffering than I would to a member of my race. So it is wrong to say that being is not a member of my species, and so I will give less weight to their suffering because they're not a member of my species. So that's the, the principle of equal consideration of, I, of interests, which uh, I have defended in my book, uh, Animal Liberation, and in many other articles. And although uh, it's now 46 years since Animal Liberation was published, and there's been a lot of discussion about it. Um, although some people have tried to criticize it, I think that nobody has really succeeded in undermining the foundations of that argument. And I'm pleased that an increasing number of philosophers seem to agree with me, even philosophers who come from different kinds of, of ethical foundations to my own. My own is a broadly utilitarian foundation. But uh, the Kantian philosopher, Christine Korsgaard, for example, has written an excellent book about animals. Uh, there are people writing from uh, a whole range of different moral perspectives and recognizing that we are wronging animals and we should change. Now, if you ask how should we change, there's such a vast area of ways in which we abuse animals that I could take many hours to discuss them. But um, as, uh, as uh, Bharti indicated, I'm going to focus on factory farming because I think that is the greatest single source of suffering that we inflict on animals. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One is that the suffering is, is long drawn out. There are certainly other things we do where we cause pain unnecessarily and unjustifiably to animals. But in the case of animals in factory farms, they are often having miserable lives for their entire lives. The, uh, the farms are constructed on the idea of producing the animal products as cheaply as possible. And in a competitive market economy, in fact, if you don't do that, you'll be out of business. But um, that is quite separate from keeping the animals in conditions that meet their needs their physical needs, their psychological needs, their social needs. These animals come from species that have evolved to live in small groups, and um, they're denied that uh, to move freely, to exercise, get fresh air, to graze on grass perhaps, or to root around if they're pigs, say, or to peck on for insects if they're birds, if they're chickens, and to dust bathe. They can't do 
any of that. So their lives are uh, miserable. They're frustrated and thwarted for their entire lives. And secondly, the numbers are simply so vast that uh, this is why there's such an immense universe of animal suffering that we are causing. Um, uh, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says that there are more than 70 billion uh, animals raised and killed for food each year. The, the great majority of them, certainly more than 50 billion um, raised in factory farms. And I've looked at some of the figures for India that uh, FIAPO has provided, and I understand that you have something like 1.8 billion uh, chickens raised for meat. Um, you have um, something like, um, uh, I think, um, I forget the number now, maybe it was, um, yeah, some, something like uh, 180 million, is it, um, birds in cages for laying hens, um, laying eggs. Uh, and um, of course, there are also large numbers of pigs and you have the world's largest flock of dairy cows, um, not all of whom are grazing in fields either. Um, so, uh, and that is only looking at land animals, right? If we, we should certainly consider the suffering of all vertebrate animals, um, because I think it's very clear that they can feel pain. Uh, I think there are some invertebrates that can feel pain too, certainly uh, like cephalopods, the octopus and squid, I think, but quite possibly other invertebrates too, like uh, lobsters and um, maybe crustaceans like, like shrimps are also raised in immense numbers. So I think we need to expand beyond the land animals. And, and if we're talking about fish, then again, uh, the factory farming of fish called aquaculture has hugely expanded in uh, worldwide and I think particularly in India. So um, we again are adding uh, not just millions, not just uh, tens of millions, but hundreds of millions or even a billion or more um, fish being again closely confined in factory farms for um, uh, their entire lives. And you know, certainly stressed by the, the crowding and confinement and the prevalence of disease. So you therefore can ask, well, well, what can we do about this? And I noticed in the introduction that, uh, and in the looking at the conference program, you do have sessions about um, alternatives, about plant-based alternatives. And indeed in India, that's particularly appropriate because of course you have the largest number of vegetarians in the world. And uh, you have uh, traditions of being vegetarian that are uh, very strong in India. And although I don't think that's quite enough, given the abuses of the in the dairy industry in particular, and of course, as I just said, for certainly for the factory farmed egg industry. Um, so, uh, but still, it's a, it's a really important step. And I think uh, the best way to end this abuse of animals is indeed to try to encourage people to move away from consuming those products and uh, to get them at least to reduce their meat consumption, preferably as, as to abandon it altogether. And that not only has good consequences for animals, reducing their suffering, it's also now we recognize really important for the climate of our planet, um, particularly uh, ruminants like, like cows, um, uh, are major contributors to greenhouse gases and to the warming of the planet. We should also uh, realize now um, that the very kind of reason why this is an online conference, the pandemic, is something that even if this particular pandemic did not come out of factory farms, we have had other new viruses that do. The uh, swine flu pandemic of 2009 did. We've had avian influenza epidemics locally that did. Um, and all of the authorities warn that if you crowd tens of thousands of animals together in a shed, um, stress them, weaken their immune responses, that is the ideal environment to breed new viruses, which will then get transferred to humans through the people who handle them. So there are really important reasons for trying to end factory farming and to um, move to a more plant-based diet. Um, and I'm Delighted that uh, I know you're working for this in India. Um, I think it has to be a, a global thing that we do everywhere to try to get this change. And I'm very happy to be uh, a part of this conference, as I said, in India and to contribute to, I hope, to encouraging you to change there as um, I've done in 
many other countries. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go on uh, further because I do think that when you're at an online conference, it's great to have some participation and some discussion and Q&A. So I'm going to pause at this point and I'll invite your questions and I'll look forward to hearing from them. Thank you so much, Dr. Singer. I think uh, all the essential points of your thought and your work, you've just been, you've just summarized all of it. So there's a lot there for us to unpack and I will try my best to, in the short time that we have with you, uh, try and put some questions, both questions that I've been eagerly waiting to ask, as well as questions that the uh, moderator, uh, that the audience has, has, has for you. Uh, your work concerns itself uh, both with people who live in extreme poverty and animals that experience the maximum suffering. Uh, in the global south, particularly in countries like India, governments and even movements sometimes uh, present the interests of these two as uh, almost opposed to each other. Um, how do you reconcile this? I don't believe that there is an opposition between the interest of people on, on low incomes and the interest of um, animals. I think that uh, one of the factors why food prices are higher than they need to be is that we grow so much grain and uh, soybean as well, and we feed it to animals. Um, that you know, happens with factory farming in general. If you take animals away from the fields and the places where they would naturally graze and find their own food, or um, then, uh, of course, you have to feed them. And to feed them, you have to grow things for them. As I say, it's usually grain and soybeans for the land-based animals. And in the case of uh, fish, carnivorous fish, it's other fish. And it takes a lot of uh, many kilos of fish to, to produce uh, wild fish, to produce one kilo of fish for sale. So um, this is really very wasteful of food. And if we moved away from it, uh, we would have more opportunities to help people to get fed well. Um, but look, I'm, I'm certainly not insisting that uh, everybody become uh, vegan straight away. Uh, clearly, there are some people who do need to raise animals for themselves to add some protein to their diet. Um, when I call on people to become vegan, I'm really thinking of people who have the opportunity to change what they eat, have the means to do that. Um, if, if not, then okay. Um, but certainly don't confine your animals inside, allow them, as I said, to find their own food and make it an occasional supplement to the plant-based diet that you will normally have. And most people living in poverty don't eat a lot of meat anyway. Um, they can't afford to buy it. Um, and and I, I would accept that. So in the I, I don't really think there is a opposition or contradiction between concern for people in poverty and concern for animals. You've uh, called yourself a pragmatic vegan uh, on some occasions, if I get the phrase right. And uh, at the same time, you're also a very strong, uh, um, uh, you know, your, the philosophy is about the morality of eating animals. Your work has focused on that. Uh, in India, a big defense of uh, animal agriculture has been that a large part of it is a smallholder farming, like you just mentioned, uh, cows and goats, uh, backyard poultry, and there, where there are varying degrees of freedom that animals are accorded. Um, but as you yourself mentioned, most of these, about 79% of the dairies that we studied at FIAPO, for example, the cows were kept tethered all day. So in uh, such a question of relative freedoms that, that uh, we face, um, do you think that uh, in such conditions, animal agriculture is morally defensible at all? Well, I, I, I don't really think it's defensible to keep a cow tethered all day. Um, I could understand if there are uh, people who are smallholder farmers and um, they feel that they can't feed their families properly without that. You know, I'm not really going to blame them for doing that. It's not, uh, not like they're morally wicked or anything like that. Uh, I can't say what I would do if I needed to tether a cow in order to make sure that my children got an adequate diet. Um, but I do think we need to try to find alternatives. We need to move away from those systems. Um, 
I'm sure that they're not the most uh, effective systems that we can think of for feeding families. And uh, so that, that may be uh, you know, a slow process. Um, not everything can happen overnight. Yes. Uh, uh, for me, the, the, the real priority is getting rid of the big industrial factory farms, which are quite unnecessary. And the people who buy those products can certainly shift to animal products, uh, sorry, to non-animal products. Um, uh, and I would, I would worry about the smallholders who uh, may be keeping a single cow or running a few chickens. Um, I, I would worry about that when we've dealt with uh, the big industrial corporations that are providing food for people who are wealthy and who have lots of other choices for what to eat. Right. Right. We have been overwhelmed with questions uh, and uh, we believe there are more than 100 people who've signed up for this uh, particular session. And um, so I'm just going to, uh, to give the participants a chance, I'm going to ask some of the questions that have come in to me. Sure. Um, so one question is, do we need a political decision to reduce factory farming um, to make sufficient impact? Or is it enough that each one makes a decision at an individual level? Will that change? Will that bring about change? Um, I do think that we need governments to act. And I think governments uh, should act. Uh, and they should act in two ways. Uh, one is they should act uh, at least to, to prohibit the worst abuses of animals in factory farms. Um, and this has happened in a number of countries. In fact, across the entire European Union, um, so there are rules about cage sizes. You can't have the small standard battery cages that they used to have. And in fact, the European Union is now considering phasing out cages for laying hens altogether. They haven't done that, but the cages have to be significantly larger than the cages in most other countries. Um, you can't confine uh, a veal calf or a a, a pregnant sow in an individual stall. Uh, that was common practice where the stalls were so narrow, the animals couldn't turn around even, let alone, you know, walk around. They were just, you know, stall basically built around the, their body. Um, and those have been outlawed in, in the European Union. And also in some states of the United States, uh, particularly California, after a, a referendum on those questions, the population uh, did strongly support the prohibition of those practices. And I feel uh, in most countries, populations, if they were informed about what's happening, would prohibit it. I feel sure that that would be true of India as well. And so I think governments have a responsibility to act and to uh, respond to the views of their population or even to lead um, to help to reduce animal suffering. And that would um, uh, also help people to transition to other products because um, you know, the reason that these methods are used is because they produce a cheaper product, not a lot cheaper, but somewhat cheaper. So that would make the plant-based uh, products more competitive. And the second thing that I think governments ought to do is in fact, to develop those plant-based products, to provide incentives for them to develop um, because they are important, as I've just said, not only for animals, but also for uh, climate and for public health in reducing pandemic risk. So those are clearly government responsibilities. Even if governments were to say we're not concerned about animals, which I think would be quite wrong, but if they were to say that, they've got to be concerned about the long-term welfare of their people. Uh, and that's, those are reasons for moving away from animal products too. Yes, that, that in fact was um, uh, the follow-up question that I had, um, that the, if the moral argument uh, alone isn't enough to convince big agribusiness and uh, governments, then the current situation where we are talking about climate change and the situation with the pandemic and zoonotic diseases. So do you think that those are more convincing arguments to use with big business and uh, government? Um, it's hard to say, you know, they may be more convincing for some people and they may be less convincing for others. Um, I think, incidentally, they're, they're all moral arguments. I think caring about the future of our planet and future generations um, and the health of, of people all over the world are also moral imperatives, uh, just as caring for the interests of animals is a, is a moral imperative. So uh, I see this as a mix of moral arguments, and I'm prepared to use uh, those three 
major arguments uh, to try to persuade people. Maybe in combination, they would do better than any single argument would do. So one of the questions we have is when it comes to speciesism, one argument that I've made is that when we say that we choose to eat plants, which are also a species, isn't that still speciesism? Are we then effectively saying that our focus is on equal concentration of sentient spe species? This is a question that has come in from above. Yes, it's certainly people often do ask me about, about mm -hmm. plants. So um, it's not speciesism to be concerned about beings who are capable of suffering, to be concerned about them in a way that we're not concerned about, about plants, which is not to say that we shouldn't be concerned about plants in, in various respects. All of our life depends on plants. They're an essential element of the ecology. Um, we, can, we can respect plants in, in their own ways. But um, to say that uh, I don't want to contribute to and be complicit in the suffering that is inflicted on conscious sentient beings, um, and that's a priority for me, more than um, damaging other living species, members of other living species that are not sentient, that seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable position. You could call it sentientism if you wished, rather than speciesism. But the difference is that I think sentientism is actually a, a defensible position that's, a, that's based on a significant moral distinction in the way that neither race nor uh, species is a significant moral distinction. We have another question. What do you think about the morality of cultivated meat, lab-grown meat? Uh, so if um, lab-grown meat can be produced in ways that uh, don't harm animals, and that seems to be uh, the case, there's, there's never a living sentient organism. Um, if it's grown in, in a lab from animal cells, um, uh, and if it is uh, much more environmentally sustainable, which uh, all the methods used uh, appear to be, and uh, of course it doesn't produce the risk of pandemics either, then I think uh, even though it's still meat, the moral arguments against it um, are, are catered for. It, it doesn't uh, do any of the bad things that meat does, doesn't inflict suffering on animals, doesn't contribute to climate change, doesn't increase the risk of pandemics. Um, so, you know, I, I, I hope for success for those people who are companies who are now developing uh, lab meat or cultured meat, as they sometimes call it. Uh, and if they can do it a, in a way that is economically competitive with meat from animals, that could be a very good thing because it would could lead to more people switching over from meat from animals to cultured meat. Uh, and that would be much better for all of those groups that I've mentioned. We also have um, the, someone talking about this whole, you know, the, the welfare of animals and the abolition of any form of animal agri agriculture is often a point of contention between uh, animal protection organizations. Um, so this question is, can animal welfare really help animals or does it only reduce the guilt of consumers um, that, and give them this perception that they are being humane? No, I think animal welfare definitely helps animals. And uh, the example that I mentioned before of the laws in the European Union have helped hundreds of millions of animals, um, well, billions, no doubt, over the years that it's existed now. Um, uh, and you can see, you know, anybody who observes animals and understands the behavior of hens, for example, can see that they are less stressed in uh, the you know, larger conditions in, or, or not in cages at all, um, particularly if they're able to range outside freely, that, you know, that, that they have a better life than if they're crammed into a small wire cage with, you know, four, five, eight, sometimes 10 other hens uh, where they can't even move away from the more aggressive birds that might peck at them. So um, I think definitely these changes are making huge improvements in the well-being of animals and uh, also trying to reduce the number of animals in factory farms is important. So no, it's, it's not just to make us feel good. Uh, it's to make concrete differences to the well-being of the animals. We have um, also at uh, this conference a large number of students who've uh, joined us, I think for the very first time, college students who've joined in. And uh, we have a question 
from uh, a student, what can we do to spread veganism as a student? Well, um, I'm often asked that question also by students at um, Princeton University where I teach. Uh, so first spread it in your university, in your campus and in whatever the dining facilities are that you have, the eating facilities. Um, I mean, some universities are residential and food is provided by the university. Others maybe are in cities where you just go somewhere else or there's a cafeteria. Um, firstly, make sure that there are uh, vegan options uh, for people to choose uh, in any university provided dining services. Uh, then try to promote the use of those, trying to get other students to understand the reasons, form an organization of uh, vegan students or whatever you want to call yourself and uh, promote talks and lectures and um, tastings, maybe uh, serve, serve some vegan food at them where you can help people to understand the reasons for avoiding animal products and also get them to see how tasty that can be. Yeah. So we have another question. How long can unfettered meat consumption continue to justify freedom of choice? At which point do we move from uh, choice to prescription? Uh, so I think we can't prescribe meat uh, consumption until we have a large majority of support for it. Otherwise, we just get into the situation of uh, prohibition when alcohol was prohibited in the United States in the 1920s, and you just allow organized crime to produce this substance and to get wealthy from selling it. Um, and if there's a demand for it, and a lot of people don't see anything wrong with it, that's what's going to happen. So we do have to make the movement more gradually than that. We have to educate people. We have to provide them with uh, alternatives that are affordable and tasty and healthy for them. Uh, and then when we get a large part of the population uh, supporting this, we can move to uh, proscribe um, the raising of animals for food. Uh, we just have uh, three minutes left. So um, we have so many questions that we haven't asked. Uh, I haven't been able to ask because of the lack of time. So uh, the, the idea is at an individual level, when one, uh, I'm asking this question of you as a philosopher who has talked about the moral progress of countries and society. Uh, at a personal level, when once you're aware of the plight of chicken, cows, goats, slaughtered for meat, do you think it's a moral imperative for a person to stop eating meat? Um, so I think it's it's certainly the, the right thing to do. And um, in normal circumstances where they have uh, options and choices, yes, I think that's what they should do. Um, as you said before, I'm, I'm a pragmatic vegan. That means, um, you know, I'm not going to insist on absolute purity at all times. So if I'm traveling and it's, uh, you know, the, the, the food that is available has some, perhaps some dairy products in it or some egg in it, um, and that's been prepared. And, um, you know, like I'll, I'll accept that because for me, the, the main point is to reduce my contribution to these industries. And so I won't buy those products. I don't want to contribute the money that I would spend to buy them. But if there's a tiny quantity of something in it, um, that comes from an animal. It, you know, it's it's not a religion for me. It's it's a practical philosophy for trying to live in a way that contributes to making the world better and doesn't support those industries that are making the world worse. Thank you, Dr. Singer. I mean, we could discuss this. I'm really, I wish we had more time so that we could ask all the questions that have come in. Uh, but thank you so much for coming in. It's quite uh, late in the afternoon where you are. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining thank us. Thank you. As I said, I was honored to be invited to give this talk and I'm very happy to have this connection with, with FIAPO and uh, I wish you well and, and hope to be uh, able to assist in some other ways in, in future too. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that.